I'm Alex Del Sordo. I'm Alex Del Sordo. I'm Alex Del Sordo, and we have, but we have just Eddie. It's Kevin Sauer. Needed to France. Eric Murray. He, it's Mahe Drysdale. It is Sir Matthew Pinson. I'm Alex Del Sordo with Rower's Choice, and this is another podcast. Now, if you're watching this podcast, you're going to notice that I am in a jacket, and I'm all buttoned up, and I'm really, really, I'm really, really trying to be warm. And the guy to my left or right on the screen is uh, in sunny Florida. Now, here's the great thing about this uh, interview. It's really two guys catching up. We've known each other now for probably going on a decade. And that's Nick Johnson, the head coach all the way down at Barry University in Florida. Nick, I appreciate being here with me today. I appreciate you having me. So, Nick, off camera, I said, like, I know, I know your whole, your whole rowing career, right? I know the whole thing. But the people that are going to listen or watch this do not. So I want to know. Where were you? How old were you when you took that first stroke? Oh, I would have been a, a sophomore at Virginia Tech out on beautiful Claytor Lake. So Virginia Tech, you know, what is this, like 1996, 97? Is that like Man, when that hurts? Were? That hurts. Yeah, that would have been uh, fall of 97. It really wasn't a big program in the 90s like um actually i would love to know the history of virginia tech because there have been some speed but not a lot of it it was um so my my coach my varsity coach dave schuster was really one of the you know i'd say founding fathers of the program i'm not sure if he created it but he was certainly there in its infancy yeah. um you know he rode at tech and really kind of got the ball rolling and then he managed to uh, get get an actual day job working at the university, working in club sports, so that then he could, you know, afford to, you know, get the incredible stipend of, of you know, two thousand dollars, whatever we gave him to coach, and then he coached the whole time I was there for several years after I graduated, and um, you know, you say it wasn't a very large program back then, but it was it was probably one of that was probably one of the larger time periods for Virginia Tech crew because we had, you know, by by club standards, a pretty decent sized team. We always had, you know, two varsity boats and we would always have a couple of novice boats. Uh, women's team was probably similar in size. But, you know, I, I remember I remember going to the informational meeting and like 100 kids were there. So wow. it was, you know, I mean, it's, you know, 30 it's bigger now, but 30,000 kids on campus, you're going to draw at least a little bit of interest from some, you know, former athletes. So why did you go to that information? Like, you know, cause rowing, let's be real. Like it's Virginia. It's, it's all, it's all, it's not, it's not like, you know, boathouse row. Uh, why did you go there? I, I started out as a runner. I started out running track and cross country in college. Um, and just thoroughly got my butt kicked trying to run for a big D1 school, um, you know, I was, I remember I, I, we were doing a workout one day, we did uh, what, running indoor track, I, we were doing a three by one mile workout. And the, the second interval, the second mile, I set a new PR for, for the mile, like in the middle of a workout. And, and it was like, I don't know, 440 or something, which I thought was, I thought was pretty quick. Oh. But there were guys on the team that were, you know, they're shooting to go under four minutes and make all American status. You know, like if there was a, a an A team and a B team, I was on the C team. Like <laughs> I, I remember I remember we did we had we had two home meets that that winter and the coach wouldn't give me a uniform. I, I, I showed up. I showed up to the meet wearing a sleeveless Guns N' Roses shirt because I wasn't good enough to get a uni. So that was kind of my, my status on the team. And um, after I didn't even make it to the outdoor season, like towards the end of the winter season, I was like, this is not for me. I'm not hacking it with these guys. And um, I tried to go play uh, spring soccer and, you know, it's a fall sport, but then they have like spring, you know, try out and see if you can make the team. And, and again, they had like, the maroon team, which was the guys on the varsity squad, they had the orange team, which was the guys on like the club team, the travel team. 
And then they had the white team, which was just everybody else. And they just, they just told me show up wearing a white shirt every day. They didn't give me a white shirt. They said, just show up wearing a white shirt. And so that lasted a month. And at that point I was like, I, I want to do something. And I, I thought about transferring somewhere to go try to run somewhere else. And, um, uh, a friend of mine, like we we're just sitting at lunch in the cafeteria and, he, you know, they pick up this flyer that was sitting on the table and said, Hey, I, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who's on the team. You should try rowing. They seem to really enjoy it. And so that, you know, months later, this is still spring months later, fall of my, of my sophomore year, I showed up for the, for the meeting and said, why not? Let's see, let's see what it is. This is so funny. I love like the whole C team thing. That is so, I love that you like can laugh at that now, you know, many years later. Oh, cause it was, it was heartbreaking at the time. Oh. You know, when you're, when you're, when you're setting a PR for your mile and the guys around you are like 20 seconds, 30 seconds quicker for their workout. And you, you know, you don't even have a chance to, you know, acknowledge it. And cause nobody cares, nobody cares. You run a 440 and people are like, that's it. And that's your be- That's the best you ever did. Oh, wow. So yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking at the time, but you think about, you know, 20 years later, like I would, I would kill to run sub six minutes now. Oh God. What, what, so what were your stats in terms of height and weight when you first started rowing? Um, I was probably, um, I mean, I wasn't more than probably 145 pounds when I started rowing. Um, you know, I, 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 High school playing soccer and running, I was probably 150, 160, and then lost a bunch of weight from just, I mean, a bunch of weight, lost five or 10 pounds, you know, freshman year running cross country and track. And, um, you know, so I showed up and I think pretty quickly, you know, Dave Schuster, our our head coach said, you know, this guy is going to probably be in the lightweight boat. So, um, you know, first couple of years rowing on the team, I was... I was what helped us make the average. <laughs> now you guys did pretty good though uh, in that lightweight boat. What did you guys? Uh, what did you guys get? I mean, we won. You know, we won a lot of stuff regionally. We would win races at the Occoquan. We, um, I think, we were the first tech boat to ever get a medal at Sierra's down in at Oak Ridge. We were the first, maybe the only boat from tech. I'm sure there's somebody from a later year that's going to correct me on this, but I think we were the, we were definitely the first, maybe the last boat to go to IRAs, um, you know, back when they let club teams go to IRAs and um, yeah, we were pretty good. I mean, we got national ranking, whatever that counts for 20 years ago. So it was, it was cool. It was a fun time. So then what happens, what happens after, uh, well, actually uh, one more question. Um, Senior year, junior year, whatever it was, what was your fastest 2K at this at, on the team? Can you think back? Uh, it was it was in the 30s. It was probably like 633, 635, something like that. I I remember I remember when I first started rowing, um, like nobody in the lightweight boat was under seven minutes. And and you know, keep in mind, I mean, this is you know club rowing in the 90s we were rowing on the the bees that had the wooden foot plates you know <laughs> on the erg and the if you pried open the fan you could you could stick your finger in there and lose a digit so this is you know the, the stone age for for people of our generation but um you know i think i i might i might have been the first guy or maybe my my buddy mike might have been the first guy to crack seven minutes and then it just kind of snowballed from there so i think you know my senior year you know, our, our whole eight was under probably 650, which for a club team like Virginia Tech at the time, that's, that was that was huge. Like, that's, yeah, we weren't we weren't Columbia. We weren't Yale. We weren't any of the you know, the big lightweight programs back then. But we were um, for a club team. We were pretty we we're pretty OK. So let's let's move into your coaching career because you know I think you, you've sort of been a I call you a journeyman you know you've 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 been to a lot of programs and what I what what I a lot of respect I have for you is like you just you kept finding the next job that that was it just got better for you each and every time like you advanced pretty quickly in places and now here you are running a college program uh, and finding success so like where was your first coaching job how old were you when what year was it. 
my first coaching job would have been uh, spring of 06. I was coaching at Holton Arm School uh, yeah. up in Bethesda, Maryland. And um, I really kind of found it by, by accident. Um, I, you know, completely unrelated to, to the story. I, I didn't have a job at that point. And I was just kind of like trying to figure out how to pay the bills and what I was going to do. And um, I was working at a, a gym to make a couple dollars here and there. And um, I picked up this, this thing called a newspaper that I don't think anybody <laughs> uses anymore. They, they used to have an actual classified section in the newspaper and you look for jobs. And I was looking through the classifieds and I, I can't imagine anybody today posting a you know rowing coach no. position in the, in the Washington Post. But... Um, <laughs> That was how that was how I found that they Holton Arms was looking for an assistant coach. And I said, this sounds like fun. I, I remember what rowing's like. I, I wouldn't mind trying to do that. And, uh, you know, I can't remember if I emailed them or called them because it was again, this is 2006. 2006. Not everybody would reply to emails in a week. So um, <laughs> went in for an interview. They said, yeah, sure. Come on. Come on down. We'll give you. I want to say my first coach, I want to say I made like $2,500 for that spring. And um, the the next year, the the head coach said, you know, hey, I'm getting a, a big kid job. I'm going to be working as a teacher at the school. So I'm not going to be the head coach anymore. And so year two, they moved me up to head coach. Wow. Now, um, I guess briefly, uh I would say briefly, I mean, you had six years of like not rowing and then all of a sudden coaching. Um, it's, it's sort of rare. Most people nowadays, like they just stay in it. They don't, they, they go from graduating right to the coaching world. Um, what, uh, give me, give me a 30 second breakdown of what you did for six years. <laughs> Cause that's, that's a lot of time. Well, I mean, so I guess technically Holton Arms was not my first coaching job. I did spend about a month in Athens, Ohio, right after graduating from college, I went to um, Ohio University and coached their club team for about a month. And a month. it um, it was very much a, hey, we're going to give you all this stuff. We're going to pay for your, for your apartment and we're going to give you a stipend and it's going to be awesome. And then it turned into, um, you know, hey, we found an apartment for you but we're not going to pay you utilities and it's in the basement of this, this uh, old house and <laughs> our, the stipend, the stipend's going away as well. So <laughs> it, it pretty quickly went from, this is going to be awesome to, I got to get out of here. Um, yeah. And then I got, you know, a, a big boy job and started working for this financial consulting firm and had like an actual desk job. I got into bike racing, which took the majority of the money that I made from that job. And um, at one point, I thought I was going to become a professional cyclist, which is why I then was unemployed in 2005, 2006, because I decided I was going to quit my job and go be a, a professional biker. I thought I was the, the next Lance Armstrong, and uh, I, was, I was not. And um, they wouldn't give me a jersey. They, they just show up at a Guns and Roses. No, they, they said you got to you got to buy your own jersey, and you got to you got to actually go train, and you have to like work hard. You can't just show up and say, "Hey, I want to be a pro." Um, and so that that kind of fell by the wayside, and um, um, yeah, that turned into working at a gym and trying to get a, a job as a coach. So and here you found you found Houghton Arms. You get the HUD coaching job in 07. Now, for those watching, listening, uh, it's Thompson's Boat Center. Uh, there's like 17 teams at, at Thompson's Boat Center. And it's sort of the, the mecca of mid-Atlantic rowing, aside from if you include, you know, uh, Boathouse Row. So you're the head coach. Now, I know you made a lot of moves in this like seven, five to seven year period uh, in these 2000s. So what happens next with Holton Arms? I coached, I coached at Holton for probably four or five years. Um, you know, tried to, try to build the program up, tried to make it something that, um, you know, was a, was a step up from where it had been prior. We went from trying to race fours to racing eights, had, you know, moderate success, you know, then some, some ups and downs, um, went from there to then coaching at a, a little school called Bishop O'Connell. And that's where you and I meet. Now you and I meet in 2011, 12. That's when we, that's when we cross 
that's when we crossed paths. Now that, that school was very interesting in my perspective. The parents didn't know shit about rowing, but they sure as hell wanted to uh, <laughs> control us like they did, right? It was, it's, uh, I think that's the, the failure that so many high schools have is that parents, and I'm a parent, right? I, like, I don't, I still don't understand why they act this way. Uh, is they want to control everything and they don't they don't allow the coaching staff to make the decisions um, but you were only there for about two years right not even I mean we we did we did that that fall and spring I guess maybe I was with the team for a little bit the next fall right. yeah and yeah, then right. and then that was it so yeah I, mean, I don't I don't remember I don't remember a ton I remember we had what do we have three eights that were from three different manufacturers yes if whenever we wanted to go somewhere, we needed like four wrenches and a screwdriver to, to derig everything. Um, My favorite story is our first year together, Dan Shank was with me on the boys' side, you're on the girls' side. And we show up at the Aquaquan, or no, uh, Anacostia. And it was before they had the big white, you know, tent, and we were like under this bridge. And we forgot a foot stretcher in one of the resolutes that we had brought. and. Dan's like, I got an idea. And he ran, got under someone else's boat, took it out, <laughs> put it in our boat. And I was like, was like do we just steal something? Like, should we be like? <laughs> I'm sure he replaced it. I'm sure he put it right back. He put it right back. Dan Shank put it right back. Now he was a, a word of his, uh, he was a man of his word. But so where do you go next? Like you're now, you got quite a, quite a rap, uh, a resume here, 2006, 2012, you're, head coach, running programs, you're, you're building junior rowing. Where, where do you go next? From there, I went to uh, to Yorktown, worked with Carol Dinian for a couple of years, you know, trying to, to build that program up a little more. Um, again, we had, you know, a pretty decent amount of success the two, two years I was there. And then um, I was towards the, towards the end of that second year, uh, Chris Gordon at McLean, he and I had been you know, pretty good buddies during the, the years that I've been at Thompson's. Obviously, he'd been there for ever and ever and ever. And he said, I'm getting out of coaching. I think you'd be a great fit taking over the program here at McLean. And um, I met with their booster president. He and I got along really well. And uh, I don't remember if there was an actual interview with the rest of the board or if he just said, this is our guy. But then I, I took over as the head coach at McLean, which was at that point, probably the, the biggest program I had, I had coached. What's funny is, again, people that don't know DC, I mean, you just went through four teams, four distinctly different programs with different goals, and they all share three boat bays. Like, they're all within right. yeah. feet of each other. That, that blows my mind. Um, now, during the summers, like, did you do, ever do any coaching for Thompson's or any of the, like, the high-level stuff? I did. It kind of, you know, snowballed from when I started coaching at, at Holton. Um, I think probably like my second or third year, you know, you get, you get bored during the summer, really. Like if you're not coaching something, then what are you, what are you doing? And um, so I started, I remember one summer I coached the guys with, uh, with Elliot Lane, he and I were coaching TBC together. Oh, yeah. And then I started doing um, old dominion boat club. I did some stuff with them in the fall I was coaching some programs with um, with PBC during the summer. Um, you know, started the the junior sculling program there that I think has really taken off. Um, ironically, somewhat under under Carol Denny, and she's kind of picked up that that flag and run with it. So, and that program has really. I remember the first year we did it, we were like fighting tooth and nail to try to get kids from Thompson's to come over and do. Yeah. PBC because you know during the summer if you're not rowing for Thompson's then what are you doing and um it took a while for that program to really start to get some some traction with the with the high school kids and understanding that you know racing a, a quad at at club nationals is is still pretty big so uh I think a, a question I have I guess for, for the listeners and people tuning in having looking you know hindsight 2020 do you recommend coaches that are in these hotbeds where there's like 20 teams do you recommend them trying different teams or would you think do you have preferred to have stayed in one the whole time uh i mean you know probably not the answer you want but i think it just really depends you know it depends on 
what you're looking for and what you're trying to do. Um, you know, when, when I started coaching, I don't think my goal was to become a career coach. I don't think that was what really my goal that that first job was just to try to make enough money to, to pay rent. You know, like I wasn't thinking, you know, hey, I'm going to retire as a coach someday. Um, I'm still not sure if I'm going to retire some coach as, as, as a coach someday. But, um, you know, the the goal is going to differ from from person to person. You know, I was, what, 30 years old, almost, you know, not quite 30 years old when I started coaching. Most people get into it right out of college. Right. So yeah. their goals maybe are a little different from what my goals were. Um, I, I think there is a benefit to having different people around you you know, having a different coaching staff around you, having somebody, whether you're, if you're coaching a girls program and you have a different coach on the guy side from program to program to program, like that gives you a different perspective on, on how things should run. Um, you know, I, I think, I think every coach is some sort of, of mixture, some sort of amalgamation of, of everybody that they've ever either coached with or being or coached under. And so the more people you have that are kind of part of that pot, the, the more rounded you're going to be. So, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a good coach because I've been around 20 different coaches over, over the last 15 years, but it certainly gives me a different perspective on, on what, what you should be doing or what you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. I, I don't think it's to, for a coaching career, I don't think it matters if you win a lot of races or if you see a lot of success. Like, you know, you got like Mark Mandel, you got guys that were with programs for five, six, seven, eight years, and they win four Stotesbury medals or whatever it is. Like you don't necessarily need those victories to get the good job somewhere else. Right. Um, and I like that. I mean, rounded, you're talking about a more rounded coaching approach. You know, you, you learn so much by, being at Holton Arms for three years, O'Connell for two years, Yorktown for three years, like you learn things. Um, I know the outside perspective, at least from where I was naively in my 20s, watching you go and other like Elliot and other people like going from different teams, I was like, why the hell are they doing that? That's a dumb move. Like what, like how can they be doing that? Now as a 36 year old man, I'm like I was really smart. <laughs> that was actually a really smart approach. Now, is it, you went from McLean right to Barry, right? I think that's was your your jump or did you did you have somewhere in the middle? I had I had a couple of things in the middle. I had um as soon as I left McLean, we physically left the country and spent a year in Spain. So I had an entire oh, year right. of not coaching at all. Yes. Um you know, Katie Katie had done my last year at Spain, Katie was working in Korea teaching English. And then when she came back from that, she said, hey, I have a chance to go do the same thing in Spain and I'm going to go whether you go or not. And I was like, yeah, this seems like a pretty good idea. Why not? So, uh, you know, we put everything into a storage unit. I sold my truck and we just completely disappeared off the, off good, of, not the face truck. of the earth, but at least outside of the U.S. for a year. You, you had a nice truck. I remember, I remember that truck. Uh, I miss, I miss that truck every day. <laughs> you know, I miss seeing that truck actually. Uh, so you did. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 yeah, I did forget about that. So forgive me. I, I, I forgot about that. Um, so then, so then what happens after Spain? Like what, where, where do you go next? So we, we, we came back from Spain and it was kind of like, okay, my turn to kind of decide where we're going to go and what we're going to do. And, um, you know, applied for a bunch of jobs at that point, kind of decided, you know, I don't want to do the desk job and then part-time coaching, yeah. you know, deal again. So I was looking for jobs that were full-time or at least on, on paper, they were full-time. They paid a salary and it wasn't like, you know, here's 25 bucks an hour kind of thing. And, um, literally as soon as our plane touched down in in Fort Lauderdale I had like an interview the next day like we just immediately started driving around um I, all of the United States we went you know a couple of different places in Florida for interviews went back up to the mid-Atlantic area for a couple of interviews and then ultimately ended up in Atlanta at St. Andrews Rowing Club. St. Andrews I mean that's it's a heck of a program. Um, 
That's wild. So did the, it, it was clear that the one year off of not coaching did not affect at all your position to get a job somewhere else. No. And I, I, a couple, a couple of people, a couple of those interviews, they asked, you know, kind of along the lines of like, well, how do we know you're not going to pick up and just disappear? Oh, yeah. Good point. Again, like if, if, are you really married to the sport of rowing? Are you really going to do this forever? And, um, and I said, well, you know, you can't, how, how does anybody predict what they're going to do a year, five years, 10 years from now? So I was like, I was like, I'm probably not going to pick up and leave while, you know, you guys on the board are, are here because it's, you know, you, know, you just never know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely want to keep coaching for a while. And, um, somewhat ironically I, I did that for one year before the Barry position opened up <laughs> so this job opens up what what enticed you to apply for this role that you have now um you know they were they were coming off their second consecutive national championship you know they won in 2015 and 2016 so this is you know late spring early summer of 2016 um they've just won two ncaa's in a row and their assistant coach you know was moving on to to greener pastures and so they had this position open and you know i said this sounds like a great way to get you know foot in the front door with uh with a collegiate program which you know for a lot of um a lot of guys that rode for a club team in in college like getting into the ncaa is tough so I said, if I can, if I can get my foot in the front door, that would be, that'd be great. That'd be a great opportunity. Mm. And you did it. You got it. Was it a hard interview process? Was it, was there any challenges to it? Um, I think the hardest part was that it was kind of like today it was all zoom, like, uh, but this is, I guess this is before zoom. So it was all, you know, Skype and just phone calls. Yeah. I want to say my first interview wasn't even on Skype. I think it was just a phone a phoner with me and you know three or four people on the on the interview committee wow wow so you get this job um you guys are a good program i mean like people know barry university uh what's been your biggest accomplishment so far in that program having now gone through two years of the pandemic so like half of your time at barry has been in a pandemic situation yeah and, and that's been probably the the toughest part is that you know, I think that that first that first COVID year, spring 2020, we were we were looking to be very good. And it was a real bummer for obviously everybody that got shut down. But, you know, I think we were looking to be a very good program that year. We had a lot of depth. We had a lot of top end speed and then it all got shut down and there was virtually no recruiting the rest of the year. And a lot of kids then. Um, you know, opted out the following year. So we very quickly went from like, hey, we're gonna be really good to uh, things are not so great. And we had to kind of rebuild really this year. This year is looking, you know, pretty, you know, we're pretty optimistic about how this year will go, but, you know, it's really three years in the making that we're trying to get back to this point. Um, but as for, you know, like the, the, the highlight, at this point, it's um, I, I think my first year coaching was probably the highlight because we we had. I think we brought in like the biggest recruiting class that Barry had ever had. We brought in like 13, 12 or 13 kids that first year um, and still almost won the conference championship. We got like we shared conference boat of the year awards. We had a couple of all Americans. Um, we were pretty we were pretty excited about how that year went considering the majority of the team were in their first year with the program so you know you, you, you touched on it here and this leads me to like a like a main topic and that's uh your first year 2017 you're getting all these kids coming into Barry and now I think the landscape of college recruiting is so so different now that we went through two years of pandemic um can we just talk about some of the challenges that these high school kids face and, and maybe some some ideas on, on how to make that job easier for them? Like, what are what are some of the challenges you're seeing now as a head coach in recruiting? I think, you know, one of the biggest one of the biggest issues that a lot of these these recruits have is that they 
they're maybe not getting the best information and best advice, you know, from their from home, from their from their parents who maybe haven't gone through the process, from their their coaches who have a particular view of what it should be like, mm-hmm. and they're they're maybe not getting. Um, and this is a, a somewhat biased opinion, you know, coming from a Division two program. But, you know, I think a lot of kids are told, you know, D1 or nothing. Like, if you're not going to a D1 school, then you shouldn't even bother rowing in college or doing any sport in college. And um, they, they are oftentimes taking less money to go to a D1 school. And, you know, what's one of the biggest topics in, in the news these days, but student loans, student mm-hmm. debt. And kids are intentionally accruing student debt just so they can go, you know, get a, a partial scholarship or even be a walk on to a D1 school just to make their coach happy and just to, to put it on Instagram that they went to a D1 school. Think about that. I mean, I, all right. So you went to Virginia Tech. Uh, I went to Marietta for a year, then GW. I don't, I don't think the school, I don't think the rowing program should ever matter as much as the school experience and everything else. And, and I'm seeing a lot of the younger generation coaches just like that. They're preaching this like go big or go home type message. Um, and if I didn't go to GW, I would have had a wonderful experience at Marietta. I know I would have, and my career would not have been any really different. Um, you're meant to do what you're meant to do, right? Like you take the path. And that's a really important message. I mean, how do you, how do you get around that? How do you, like when, when you start talking to these girls specifically, like female, the rowers out there, like how do you get around that? What are some of the things that you tell them when their coach might be saying it's D1 or nothing? Well, and it's, it's something that I've, I've been telling kids, you know, even back when I was a, a high school coach and I had kids that I was coaching who were trying to get recruited, I would tell them that they need to make sure that they are going to a university that they will enjoy. You know, if you blow out your knee or herniate a disc in your back, are you still going to want to go to that school if you're not rowing? And I've, I continue trying to push that message on kids that we recruit now of, you know, it's somewhat contradictory to to recruiting but you know we're not a school that's for everybody not everybody wants to go to a a small private liberal arts school and i i definitely don't want kids coming here just for the rowing because what if something happens what if you get injured what if you hate hate the team and you have to stop rowing are you going to enjoy the university are you going to want to be here for four years and, you know, not that we're trying to talk kids out of going to, to Barry, but we want to make sure that they know what they're looking for and that they know what they want to do with it. And it's and it's, you know, the the other side of the street, too. You know, if you're going to go to a big D1, if you're from a small private prep school where you graduate with only 50 kids in your class, are you going to enjoy going to a big D1 school with 50,000 kids? You know, maybe, but have you really thought about it before you sign that NLI? How many, uh, how many total scholarships does Barry have for rowing? We're it kind of depends on the year and budgets, but we're somewhere between six to eight. That's pretty incredible. That's, that's it's, a, it's not bad. It's not bad for division two. Yeah. We're kind of uh, on the upper end of what most D2 programs have. And then like, tell me, what are some other D2 schools in the country that you consistently go up against like who's you where's your competition lie i uh, just just here in florida two of our biggest rivals are florida tech and embry riddle which is where dan shanks coaching yeah. now right. um you know nas- nationally uco you know central oklahoma has been like the team for the last four or five years um out west with them western washington they won in the early 2000s. They won like six or seven championships in a row, which is just crazy. Um, Mercyhurst, Thomas Jefferson are kind of the two big teams in the in the east side. Um, so those those are the majority of the the squads that we go up against pretty consistently. Does your um, try to try to word this correctly? Does your your staff, like the the AD and everyone else, like sort of above, above you, are they really into winning at Barry U? Is there like this drive, like you got to be the best, or do they really do they have other concerns or worries? 
I mean, our athletic department as a whole is very competitive. You know, we have, I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's like 20, low 20s for total number of national championships. We've won national championships in soccer, golf, tennis, obviously rowing, you know, so we're a very competitive athletic department in general. And the, the administration, you know, they want all of us, they want all teams to be competitive. Um, you know, now it's, it's just like any other university, any other athletic department, you know, are we getting as much attention and as much funding as, as basketball? You know, no, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think Duke rowing is getting the same attention as Duke basketball, right? Like it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's all very relevant, relative. So, um, but we get, we get just as much attention as, as any other D2 rowing program, if, if not more so. So we're on the, we're on the tail end of this pandemic and more things are happening. Um, how's the optimism for you in your program? Are you guys seeing good things for the future of rowing for the future of Barry U or are you still kind of getting through the hard stuff? Well, no, I think we're very optimistic. I, I think now that, you know, things have started to settle down in terms of COVID now that, you know, things are somewhat getting back to normal, at least in terms of, of, uh, you know, bodies on campus and, and budgets and, you know, what the future is for the university. I think everybody in the athletic department has kind of, you know, breathed a little bit of a sigh of relief that like, okay, this is where we are. Is it the same as it was two or three years ago? No, of course not. But is it um, going to be the same that it is now or better in the future? Yeah, I, I think so. So, you know, we're, you know, honestly, our, our scholarship numbers are down from where they were two, three, four years ago, but they're not going to go down anymore. You know, we're pretty optimistic that things are going to be the same. And, you know, maybe someday they start to go back up to where they were pre-COVID. But, um, you know, athletics wise, funding wise, we're pretty, we're pretty happy about where we are. And, um, you know, I think as far as recruiting and, and equipment, you know, all that stuff is, is on the rise and it's all going to get better over time. I, I asked this final question to every college coach I've ever interviewed now. And it's, uh, let's pretend I'm a 17, 18 year old girl. I just, I'm, I'm going into my senior year and tell me in 30 seconds or less, why should I go to bury you? Uh, I mean, other than the, the education, you know, obviously it's a, we're, like I said, we're a private liberal arts um, uh, school in, in South Florida. So like right off the bat, even if you're not an athlete, it's a pretty great place to be. Uh, if you're a rower, you know, we don't have a winter. We have uh, warm weather all the time. We were, we were outside erging this morning, uh, a little, little chilly for Miami in January. It was probably in the sixties, but you know, in a couple of days, we're going to get rid of this cold snap and it's going to be 75 degrees when we're rowing in the middle of January. So, um, I think in the last seven or eight years, we've bought no ergs because we don't wear them down enough to really need a, a budget for ergs. Um, so if you if you hate the erg, we're a pretty good spot for you. If you like <laughs> rowing in January and and not having it be part of your winter trip to to Miami, you know one of our favorite hashtags on on Instagram is that we train where you uh, vacation because this is this is our weather all the time. Um, great weather, great, great body of water that we get to row on. Um, I can count on one hand how many times we've had to actually cancel a practice that we had planned to go out on the water. And I think probably half of those times it was just because the coaches didn't want to go. So, you know, we very rarely, unless it's a hurricane, we very rarely have to cancel a water practice. And there you have it, everyone, from the C squad to the head coach of Barry, where if you hate erging, go on down to Miami. Uh, Nick, I actually learned a couple of things about you. I had a great time. Thank you for doing this, and I appreciate you being here today. Hey, thanks for having us. And that is it for the interview with Nick Johnson, head coach of Barry University. If you want to learn more about this wonderful program and what they're doing in sunny Miami, uh, there's links everywhere. Check them out. And I know that Nick wants to talk rowing. He loves it. And reach out. Thanks for listening. See you.